Hassan for inviting me to Swag and uh, the director of the Center for Study Working Class Life and a professor of economics out at Southern University and also a national co convener of U.S. Labor Against the War and the chair of the New York City chapter of U.S. Labor Against the War. So, um, U.S. Labor Against the War is an organization that began in the run-up to the war in Iraq uh, in 2003, it, uh, has continued and is growing, and now has about 200 uh, central labor councils, union locals, and international unions, uh, state federations, and other labor bodies around the country. And we in U.S. Labor Against the War began on the war in Iraq, extended then to Afghanistan, and as the wars have kind of both receded and also multiplied, we are in a situation where in the labor movement with all the economic crisis that's going on and all the diversion of attention from these wars, uh, we have begun to really focus on not just the wars and the, how wrong they are, but also how costly they are and how the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and more broadly, American militarized foreign policy, needs to be challenged by the labor movement uh, as part of a broader public challenge to uh, militarism. Because we just don't accept the, the usual claim that there's no money. As the budgets are being cut, and as uh, education is being cut, and social services, not just the safety net, but the whole government, is being uh, uh, reduced, what we find is uh, uh, the need to really challenge this basic idea that there is no money. Well, of course there's money. We just need to identify where that money is and go get it and move the money from uh, the pockets of the wealthy, the pockets of the super rich, the pockets of the big corporations who have escaped uh, the burdens of taxation and the joys and pleasures of taxation, I should say, also. I remember as I was growing up, my father, who was an immigrant, came to America when he was of working age and was very disappointed when he found out that he was too poor to pay taxes. He couldn't understand how he could live in a country and not pay taxes. Uh, gradually and eventually, he was able to pay taxes, and he was proud of it. Uh, so I think that uh, we need to really look at the revenue side of the budget in, in, in a different way. But we also have to look at the expenditure side and ask what the values and the priorities of the country are as reflected in that budget, which leads us right to the military budget. Um, the uh, flyer that I've uh, handed out is a, a list. This comes from uh, the National Priorities Project. And if you do not have this flyer, please uh, raise your hand and we'll get you one. Um, but in uh, fiscal year 2012, that just ended, the people of the city of New York, this is just New York City, sent $4 billion to the federal government, which then went to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, that was the share of the total budget that uh, went to the wars applied to the total amount of money that New York sent to the government. So we sent $4 billion from New York City in just that one year. And the National Priorities Project at the website that you see below has calculated what that money could buy. It's difficult just to wrap your mind around $4 billion. There's a lot of zeros in there. We don't have experience with that. We have experience with what a quart of milk costs or what a pint of ice cream costs, but we don't have experience with $4 billion. So this is a very nice summary and you'll notice that this uh, is the list of everything that could be bought with that f $4 billion. You'll notice plus at the end of every one of these things. This is additive. This is what the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan cost the people of New York City in one year of 2012. So when we say we have to end the militarized foreign policy of the United States, this is the beginning of what we're talking about. It's only the beginning because the wars are only the beginning of military expenditures. But it is uh, an indication of the, the true costs uh, in real terms of the wars. 
Then if you look at the next uh, little paragraph there, in fiscal 2012, not just from New York City, but from the whole state of New York, we spent $10.3 billion for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which was, incidentally, way more than the annual budget deficit for the state of New York. So for those of us in the public sector, I'm teaching at SUNY, in the City University, Brooklyn Downstate, Rich, which is a private hospital but was merged into the public sector when uh, Brooklyn Downstate took it over. All of those things would not have to be closed, would not be suffering the kind of budget constraints because there's no money at the state level. There is money. We pay that money. We are already paying on taxes. We don't have to increase anybody's taxes. We just have to redirect what that money is being used for. And you could say, well, gee, nothing says if you cut the military budget that that money would actually come to New York. Well, that's true, except if you remember the stimulus package that passed in 2009, there was about $60 billion of that stimulus package, or maybe more, that was directed to state and local governments so that they could withstand the rigors of the recession. When that stimulus package ended, when that aid to the states ended, which was part of the federal budget, what happened was the layoffs began. The fiscal crisis began in the states and in the municipalities. So we, instead of having stopped the aid to the public, to, to state and local governments, and stopped the war, instead of doing that, we stopped the aid to the public sector and continued the war. It was exactly the wrong thing to do, and we need to reverse that, and we need to say that that's what we want to do. So these will just give you uh, a, a few numbers. The, um, what is it called here? The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which is in Sweden, every year issues a report of the military spending around the globe, 172 countries, how much are they spending? Well, it's no surprise that the United States is, of course, the all-time champ, big-time spender in the military budget. Last year, six, uh, 68, uh, no, 682 billion, 418 million dollars. 682 billion dollars of military expenditures just last year in the United States, which exceeds the combined military budgets of the next 11 countries which exceeds the amount of money, and I'll read them in order, because I, I, I just went and looked at the website. It was kind of, I was curious myself. People's Republic of China is number two, $166 billion. That's five times less than what we spend. Oh, then comes Russia, the UK, Japan, France, Saudi Arabia, India, Germany, Italy, Brazil, and South Korea. We spend more money every year on our military than all those countries put together. So uh, we say it's time uh, for a change, as they say in some circles. So we are now dealing with this uh, sequester. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, I suppose most of you are. The uh, Congress in 2011 decided that if they couldn't make a budget cut uh, and fix the budget, they were going to impose cuts that were so draconian that no one could possibly imagine going through with it, and that would be the sort of ax over everybody's neck that would get everybody to negotiate. Well, when the push came to shove, it didn't quite happen, and here we are with the sequester. So, uh, it, it, briefly, the budget, the federal budget, is divided into, roughly into two parts. There's something called the discretionary budget, and then there is the non-discretionary budget or the fixed obligations, sometimes called entitlements, but that's not really quite exactly right. The um, sequester only applies to discretionary part of the budget. It does not apply to those parts of the budget which do not have to be renewed every year. So it doesn't apply to Social Security, which incidentally is completely outside the federal budget, the usual federal budget anyway. And the idea of bringing Social Security into the discussion of the budget deficit is just a trap and completely incorrect. But uh, we can get into that if you want a little bit more in detail later. Uh, does not include, those, the, the uh, sequester does not include uh, Medicare, doesn't include Medicaid, does not include interest on the national debt 
doesn't include other things that are fixed by Congress by uh, eligibility or by law and then they're set and you don't have to renew them every year. Those things that you have to renew every year includes the military budget and it also includes the State Department and the Department of the Interior and the Department of Justice and uh, you know the, all the rest of what the government does. So the sequester cuts about half and half of the cuts between the military and the uh, non-military discretionary money, which we should understand is not the social safety net. That's a separate issue. That's a separate set of problems. If we're talking about cutting half of, uh, out of the uh, non-military discretionary budget, we're talking about the national parks. We're talking about the post office. We're talking about the uh, um, uh, State Department and the missions around the world. You know, there was all this made about there was no protection for the mission in, 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 in Benghazi. But Congress cut the money to defend the missions of the State Department around the world. So if you're going to cut the money to defend the State Department missions around the world, you can't very well, although they did, come back and say it's the State Department who was derelict because they didn't provide security. Our government is not providing in this sequester, amplifies that, not just in the State Department, but in education and everything all the way across the board. So when we talk about this sequester and the sequester problem, we need to understand that it is not the entitlement programs. Uh, so what we have uh, now is the military takes up of that discretionary budget about 58% of the whole discretionary budget of the United States government. That's the military. So when these budget cuts are uh, coming into the military as well as into the non-military parts, it, it, they're, they are consequential. You know, real things are happening, real people are being laid off, real systems are being uh, scrapped and there are uh, consequences. In the past, we in U.S. law and in the peace movement have argued for a reduction in the defense budget. And I think it's safe to say at this point that there is going to be a reduction in the defense budget. The defense budget, not just because of the sequester, but even in fixing the sequester, everybody in Congress, everybody in the military, everybody in the Department of Defense, the leadership, State Department, all the way up and down, agrees and understands and is planning for significant cuts in the military budget. So I think quite apart from our demands, the pressures that exist around the budget are leading to that reduction in, uh, in uh, military expenditures. So for us in the labor movement, that raises particular questions. I'm in a teacher's union. I'm in the AFT. And for us, it's a good idea to cut the military budget because that means that there's more money available for education and that's easy enough to make that case. But if we take that to a central labor council or to the state fed, the UAW is there, the machinists are there, uh, steel workers are there, uh, American Federation of Government Employees are there, it's Communications Workers of America, all these are major unions representing workers in the defense industry. And so when we say, cut the budget, we don't need these weapon systems. There are machinists and there are people who are skilled trades people all over the country saying, wait a second, you're talking about my job. And those unions that represent them, represent them and say, wait a second, just like the coal, uh, the United coal uh, miners, um, United Mine Workers of America, UNWA. The United Mine Workers, will not support a cap on carbon emissions because they don't want to destroy the job of coal miners. It's a big problem in the labor movement how to make an argument that can win over and that can bring along the entire labor movement behind an agenda for peace and for the redirection of these resources. <clears throat> So what that has come to mean for us uh, in U.S. Labor Against the War, and I want to bring this to you to think about, is that it becomes very important to talk about military conversion, the conversion of military uh, production and weapons production to civilian purposes. Now, some of you uh, may remember a guy named Seymour Melman, 
who in the 1960s and 1970s as a professor of industrial engineering at Columbia University wrote Pentagon Capitalism and a number of other works that demonstrated how military procurement system and the military budget eroded American industrial capacity. And he was calling for a redirection of the funds and he was calling for the uh, limitations of the military budget and the resurrection of a civilian in a manufacturing. But what he never did was to say how that was going to work, right? How are you actually going to do that so that the people who are going to lose their jobs as machinists are going to be people who uh, can find another job building wind turbines or whatever. So what we are trying to do is to identify as well as we can the mechanisms by which we can design real programs for the conversion of military spending into peaceful uses so that we can bring the labor movement as a whole along on this uh, political journey. So it turns out that uh, the Labor Department, the Commerce Department, and the Defense Department all have grant programs for municipalities and for communities to work on conversion when weapon systems are phased out or when there are these uh, problems of the reduction in military spending in particular areas. This is a problem that the government understands. They want to make resources available to study and to uh, ameliorate those problems. There is a woman at Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., whose name is Miriam Pemberton. And uh, Miriam Pemberton is a research fellow at IPS, and her work is to figure out with communities how to take advantage of those grants and how to design specific programs that can um, not just move the money, but move the labor force uh, so that jobs are protected. So she is working in two areas in the United States, one up in Lynn, Massachusetts, where there's a GE plant that makes uh, uh, engines for fighter bombers, and then a plant out in Lima, Ohio, that makes striker vehicles. Both of these plants are facing significant cutbacks in the military budget. So what Miriam Pemberton is doing is working with the unions that are involved. In Lynn, it's the, the communications workers, uh, which took over the IUE, the, uh, uh, the uh, National Union of Electrical Workers, that represents the workers in that uh, engine plant. And then in Ohio, it's a UAW local that represents the workers in that striker production facility. So what Miriam is doing is trying to work with those unions, with the local uh, community development and economic development organizations, and the companies, together with these funding agencies, to try to actually design programs that would redirect the industrial activity into work that has a similar skill mix to the mix of the uh, population that's currently working in those plants. It's a very ambitious, but also very exciting and very detailed and, and specific kind of work that we're going to need to do. And uh, we in U.S. Labor Against the War, the New York City chapter with the Left Labor Project are bringing Miriam up to talk about this work. And I want to invite everybody to come to it. It's on Wednesday, the 24th of April. And if you can take these and pass them around, that would be good. Uh, and it's at PSC, Professional Staff Congress, uh, the union that represents uh, the City University of New York, uh, faculty and professional staff. And the uh, information is on the flyer. And, uh, We'll also be joined by uh, uh, Bill Shortell, who's the political director for the Machinists in New England, and is an active, uh, well, actually just retired after 26 years in, uh, uh, in, a, in a production facility in Hartford, uh, making uh, aircraft engines as a machinist. So that's going on, and we in, in U.S. Labor Against the War are glad to be here and glad to be part of the whole community that's asking, well, what kind of a country do we want to be? What kind of a military do we really need? What, kind, what really constitutes security? 
Is security having a lot of drones and a lot of bombers and a lot of uh, aircraft, or security having an educated population? Is security having a healthy population? Is security having full employment? We think that security are those things, and that that security and the security of the United States is undermined by the kinds of militarized foreign policy that we've been uh, promoting as a country uh, for way too many decades. So I'll stop there, and uh, I, we'll see where the discussion goes in the, in, in the questions. Thank you. Okay, my name is Mark Dunley, and I'm executive director of the Hunger Action Network of New York State, um, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, I'm also co-convener of the No Grand Bargain Coalition here in New York City. No bad grand bargain. Oh, no, well, uh, well I don't even like a grand bargain coalition. Um, but that was a coalition, actually it's more of a network, but it was about 50 organizations that came together, mainly initially more senior citizen-based organizations who were concerned about protecting um, Social Security and, and, and Medicare from the threats and they invited me in because of some work I've done in the past particularly around uh, single-payer health care and I convinced them we should also examine the other programs such as safety net programs such as food stamps, um, housing and we've also uh, been fortunate to get some of the uh, peace organizations particularly United States US Labor Against War uh, to come in and also talk about um, the, the military budget part of it. But I'll go back to the Hunger Action Network. We're 31 years old. Started right after this guy named Ronald Reagan became uh, president. And if you told us 31 years later we'd still be here, um, we would have said that uh, we had failed to do our job. You know, hunger was not a significant problem in the United States. Uh, in the late uh, 70s because of the advent of programs like food stamps and um, school meals, um, WIC, um, and then the 1981 Reagan budget cuts came along which slashed spending across the board and particularly slashed spending for public housing programs and Section 8 programs. Um, and in New York City, we did not know how many food pantries and soup kitchens, I'm sorry, we do in New York City in, in 1980. There were about 30 food pantries and soup kitchens in the entire city. We don't know how many there are statewide. Um, today is about 1,300. Uh, and most of those were created in the first 10 years uh, after the Reagan budget cuts. And we thought we were sort of temporary. You know, a generation has grown up with soup kitchens and food pantries that's at, you know, thousand points of light. Um, it's something they've always known, but in fact it was a relatively rare phenomenon. Um, and we've grown and grown and grown, and today this starts, it's at 1,300 here in New York City, and about 1.3 million people we feed on an annual basis in New York City. About 40% of which are the working poor, um, about a third of children, and surprisingly about 20% are senior citizens. That's been the big growth in the last 10 years has been senior citizens becoming poor. And Hunger Action Network has always been one of, we primarily focus at the state level, though we have done some work in recent years at the federal level because of programs like food stamps and um, the child nutrition programs. The Hunger Action Network has always been one of the leaders in the revenue campaigns in New York State uh, at the state level. Uh, working with groups like the Fiscal Policy Institute and Strong Economy for All. And people say, well, why is Hunger Action Network so focused on revenue? Well, because since our, we basically are representing low-income New Yorkers, poor people are always the last one to get the money from the public treasury. And so whenever there are cuts at the f state level in, in revenues, it's always poor people who bear the brunt of those cuts, and then when the economy rebounds and more money flows in the state coffers, it's always the anti-poverty programs are the last ones to be restored. And for instance, those cuts in 1980 have not been restored, uh, particularly to um, the housing programs. So uh, 
because of that hunger action, there was a very active initiatives like closing corporate tax loopholes and the millionaire's tax and trying to make the income tax more progressive. We have a state tax system in New York State where the janitor at Donald at Trump Tower pays more of his or her income for state and local taxes than Donald Trump does, and that's unfair. And we do the same thing recently at the federal level. So we've always approached, you know, personally I am active with the uh, Fort Greene Peace and been a long time peace activist before I moved to Brooklyn. Um, but Hunger Action Network, you know, we oppose war, but primarily we oppose the military budget. And we've been probably one of the more vocal groups in, in New York State trying to cut military spending. Um, we want a peace dividend. You know, we never got that after World War II, we never got that after the Korean War, we never got that after the Vietnam War, and we certainly didn't get that after, uh, well, I guess the wars have not ended. Um, you know, Eisenhower, when he left office, or before he left office, um, even though he was, you know, kind of intimate in, in creating the military industrial complex, he also warned people about the dangers. But his, his most famous quote in terms of what we work on is that every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies, signifies in the final sense a, th a theft from those who are hunger and are not fed and those who are cold and are not clothed. And that is why we've been working so hard on trying to cut uh, the military budget and particularly to get votes in Congress to cut the military budget. And I use the example of three years ago, we were very active in every, Congress works on these five and 10 year cycles. And so we were up for the reauthorization of the federal child nutrition program, school lunch, school breakfast, um, women, infants and children, summer meals program, child care and adult care program. Senator Gillibrand, who has been a whole lot better since she became Senator, she used to be my Congressperson, wasn't so good as my Congressperson. Um, she uh, supported our call to increase funding for the federal nutrition programs, child nutrition programs, by $4 billion. Um, President Obama put a billion dollars on the table. That was $4 billion a year, um, $10 billion over the life cycle of the 10-year funding stream. President Obama put a billion dollars on the table. In Congress, we got the grand total of $400 million, so a tenth of what Senator Gillibrand had asked for. And to pay for that $400 million, half of it came from cotton federal food stamp benefits. Cuts will actually take place later this year. Um, and so we basically robbed feeding adults and children in order to come up with more money to um, feed children. And of course we said, why aren't we cutting the military budget? And you know, so I went to this coalition, about 30 organizations in New York City who work on uh, child advocacy. And we were there to um, develop an agenda in childhood poverty in America. And I said, you know, I think most of us could probably take about an hour and write that that agenda. We just go on to the website of the Children's Defense Fund or the, the CLASP or FRAC and we just cut and paste. The agenda is going to be really quickly. The hard thing, and it's always the hard thing, it's the lesson we learn in Watergate. What's the lesson we learn in Watergate? Don't trust politicians. Don't trust politicians. That's a good lesson. <laughs> Follow the money. And I said, everything else we talk about is a waste of time. It's just, it makes us feel good. We'll have a wonderful, wonderful agenda to end childhood poverty that will line our waste paper baskets for the next you know, 10 years. We have to talk about revenues. And if we want to talk about revenues, we have to talk about cutting the military budget because that's 57 or 58 percent of the discretionary budget. And we were up in the Manhattan Borough's president office on the 10th floor. And at that point, these child care advocates started to open the window and throw me out. How dare you come to this meeting and talk about cutting the military budget? We're here to talk about childhood poverty. 
And I said, yeah, my organization been working on childhood poverty for 28 years at that point. We're all for it, you know, guaranteed minimum income, higher welfare benefits. Why is the United States the only country other than uh, South Africa, uh, industrial country with universal child care, you know, pre, you know, uh, preschool, all for it. But if you don't talk about the revenue source, it ain't real. And of course, they didn't talk about the revenue source. And you know, in case you haven't heard, we haven't ended childhood poverty. Um, and in the recent census, it really struck me. We have three cities in New York State, Schenectady, Syracuse, and Rochester, where half, half of the children officially live in poverty, half. Um, it used to be Congressman Towns, now it's uh, Mr. Jeffries, Congressman Jeffries. We used to be the sixth hungers, high sense of hunger in the entire country, was in the Flatbush, um, Central Brooklyn, um, what is some of you, Fort Greene, um, East New York. Uh, what's number one in the country? Still is number one. The poorest congressional district in America. What? South Bronx. South Bronx, that's um, Jose Serrano. That is correct. Jose Serrano. Can't even get him out to forums in the neighborhood about food, but uh, we have the, you know. So hunger is a big problem, um, you know, in, in the United States. You know, you had this thing from the New Priorities Project about where we could um, spend the money. When we created the debt ceiling in America, why did we create a debt ceiling in America which got us into this deficit crisis? Anybody know why we created a debt ceiling in America? And it's the same reason, you know, they create debt ceilings in Europe and I guess maybe debt ceilings in Japan. What motivates politicians to create debt ceilings? War. Because they know that the president will spend, I want to say like a drunken sealer, but it's not feel the sealers. He'll spend like an Albany politician on, on war, and they created we created the debt ceiling in America to protect, who prevent Woodrow Wilson from just running us in, up into debt to fund uh, World War One. And anybody hear about that in this recent debate over the debt ceiling? That the reason why we have a debt ceiling is we can't trust politicians on funding war and funding the military. Well, I didn't hear that for some reason. So when this, I guess it's the No Bad Grand Bargain Coalition. I still call it the No Grand Bargain Coalition, because uh, there is no grand bargain that's going to be good. Um, we had Jerry Nadler, Congressman Jerry Nadler came in, and you know, he explained, so why do we have a deficit? You know, actually, when we had President Clinton, I'm not a big Clinton fan, but uh, he actually got rid of the deficit. And the economists were so worried that, in fact, by the end of his term, you know, actually by the end of that uh, guy Bush's term, we didn't change things. We were going to get rid of the entire deficit. And actually, that's bad as far as economists. You're really worried what would happen if the federal government didn't have a deficit to drive demand. But there are three reasons, according to Nadler, that we have a federal budget deficit was the Bush tax cuts and unfunded war in Afghanistan and unfunded war in Iraq. So that's why we have a federal budget deficit. Now, some people are that's not entirely true. We had Wall Street greed and banker misdeed and greed, and that gave us the housing bubble, which collapsed the economy, and that drove down revenues and that control. You know, but it's those four things. But if it's unfunded wars and tax cuts for the rich, shouldn't we solve the budget deficit by raising the taxes on the rich? and either fund in the wars, or we would say, get rid of the wars. And of course, that's not what they do. And of course, this is just a typical strategy that the IMF has used around the world, and now we're using it here in the United States, is, you know, give t huge tax giveaways to the wealthy and to the large corporations, and that will create budget deficits. And then we'll use the budget deficits as an excuse to go cut all those programs for middle class and low income people uh, that had nothing to do with creating the deficit. And then of course people go really bonkers because the social security system is completely separate from anything to do with the federal budget deficit. And you know, yet 
You know, we got President Obama. You know, for five years he's been trying to cut the Social Security, you know, program. And now he's talking about doing the, you know, chain inflation. You know, so senior citizens get a little less, you know, of a inflationary adjustment. It's really a technical adjustment. You know, who did I say is the big increase in coming to food pantries and soup kitchens these days? Senior citizens. So we're going to go cut their monthly Social Security bit. Only a bag or two of food a week. You know, that's all it is. Not much at all. Why are you guys worried about it? So we're worried about it. Um, SNAP, you know, food stamp program, that is exempted from the sequestration because it is an entitlement program. But it's not exempted from the fight over the budget deficit. And that is the one program that the Republicans are most aiming at. You know, it's like Rick in uh, Rick's Cafe in Casablanca. I am shocked, shocked. There's gambling taking place here. And as a Republican, I am, I, I'm just shocked Then when we have 28 million people out of work, that more people are signing up for food stamps and that we're spending more money feeding hungry people. This is incredible. Who allowed this to occur? Let's turn food stamps into a block grant. It's basically cap the amount of money, give it to the states, and let the states, you know, worry about it. So that's A is mean. You know, we would say, well, if people are out of work and they're turning to food stamps, why don't you, like, uh, create jobs? You know, and... And when we had the last Great Depression, that former governor in New York, FDR, got, elected, got himself elected president, you know, he created a public works program, the WPA, and put people to work. We've heard nothing about a WPA-style public jobs program from anybody, you know, in Congress. And we talk about, oh, maybe this will create one million jobs, maybe this will create two million jobs, 28 million people out of work. But let's debate whether we're going to create a million jobs over here or two million jobs over here. Let's forget that's about 26 million jobs short, you know, of making this whole thing. Uh, we can go talk about income inequality. That's probably getting a little bit too far off the, the table. Um, so one, you should create jobs. But um, when Congress did the economic stimulus, okay, what did they conclude was the single most effective way to stimulate the economy among what they, I mean, you might disagree with them, but what did they conclude was the single most effective program? Is that three minutes, five minutes, or 10 minutes? Five minutes, okay. So, so what did they say was the single most effective way to stimulate the economy? Well, no, that's what they did, but they didn't want to say that with a straight face. Great works, construction works. What? Construction works. No, 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 no. Food stamp program. It had the single highest multiplier, 1.85. For every dollar they put in the food stamp program, they would come up with 1.85, you know, dollars being put back in the economy. For some reason, you know, when you give tax cuts to the rich, you know, they may go put that money in the Bahamas or take a trip to Europe. But for some reason, you give money to poor people who are hungry and tell them the only way you can spend this money is to buy food, they go out and they buy food. Um, so I guess my time is about up. Um, we want to protect, you know, the food stamp program. Certainly WIC is under direct attack. We're taking a big cut, women, infants, and children, the school meals program, job training, mass transit. You know, every time I turn around in New York City, I've only been here four years, they seem to be raising that uh, fair. And that G line is horrible. G, the A, and the C. The three worst lines in the entire city, and we got them in our neighborhood. Why can't we get more money for a decent mass uh, transit system? Um, you know, conversion, I, I agree with conversion, but one of my conversion is, you know, there's this little problem called climate change. Why don't you put people to work um, building solar and wind and stuff like that. You want to talk about a WPA style jobs program, I didn't spend much time in the hurricane relief zone, 
But I did spend one day down there rebuilding, uh, taking out sheetrock out of a house with a very, very professional crew of 12 people who spent an enormous amount of time down in Mississippi and Alabama with Hurricane Katrina. So they knew exactly what they were doing. And they did a great job. And it's all the right equipment, everything right. They were able to take out the sheetrock of one house in four hours. And how many houses do we got down there? You want to put people to work, put them down into those hurricane areas and, and, and relieve that. So we need money for jobs, conservation. We can go on, universal pre-K. Um, but I'm supposed to stop, so I'll stop. Yes. If you wanted to take like 30 seconds to uh, possibly discuss what you're doing um, or what's going on in your specific arena, anyone? Uh, oh, the cutbacks that's yeah. specifically involved in the struggle uh, against fighting, you know, these cutbacks and things like that, with, like the library closings and the uh, hospitals. We, mm -hmm. uh, we hear our citizens in the libraries, and uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, for those of you who don't know, because a lot of it uh, comes together with recently writing headlines. Uh, the city of New York is selling libraries. It is shrinking the library system. It is deliberately underfunding. The mayor is deliberately underfunding the entire library system in order to create real estate deals, which are for the benefit of real estate developers and not the public. Um, so we can <coughs> get that word out. We're trying to force through a number of deals uh, and do a lot of irreversible things before the end of Bloomberg's term. So we are trying to uh, really create a moratorium and halt that. Um, it's sort of a, uh, I, I was going to ask a question about uh, how the military funding relates to the Star of the Beast. At least some of these questions. But, uh, uh, yeah, but it sort of relates to the whole start the beast uh, approach on the federal level. Yeah. Do you have something? Hours. Yeah. We have some questions. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions. Is that all right? Anyone else have any? Uh, comments? Are we doing the first? Comments? Are we doing the first? Uh, sure. Okay. Matt's going to speak for one second, and then we're going to move on to questions right after that. Oh, uh, oh you want to take? Okay, so. Uh, yeah, no, okay. Okay. We're not doing the Q&A until I'm finished. Uh, Lock the doors because nobody's leaving here. <laughs> we have a defense budget in Brooklyn for Peace, and that is to defend uh, the peacemakers and to give us the ammunition, oh, that's a terrible word, to give us the resources to wage peace, uh, to join with our allies in the struggles in our communities. Um, I know that one of our board members, Eric Straub, has been working very close with uh, these folks from the uh, library, uh, anti-library cutback movement. Um, and Brooklyn for Peace itself also, about limited resources, has been joining uh, forces with some of the folks who are fighting hospital closures. You may or may not know that six hospitals are slated to be closed in Brooklyn. Uh, Mike mentioned the down, SUNY Downstate, which of course has been in the news recently. Um, uh, interfaith uh, uh, Medical Center about to be privatized or incorporated into a private entity with uh, Brooklyn Hospital. Um, I think that this is what was being addressed tonight because we are now seeing, you know, right here in Brooklyn, the effects of the sequester and the effects of the lopsided priorities that this, uh, that Eisenhower warned us about, that Dr. King talked about during the Vietnam War in 1967. Here we are in 2013. Um, and we're seeing it that, that uh, country cannot have guns and butter, and we want to shift those priorities. Interestingly, and I'll just say this very briefly, that Move On, which has been sort of quiet, they came into being around the fight against the Iraq War, then with the election of the president, all of a sudden there was no more talk about war. Today called um, uh, for demonstrations outside congressional offices this very Friday, because of the attacks and the proposals now from a Democratic president on Social Security. And they specifically said, Stop, don't cut our Social Security, cut the Pentagon. So more and more, you have seen uh, 
coalitions which you know did not want to get involved in cuts to the military don't talk about that don't bring that in let's talk about childhood poverty but more and more and in this uh, no bad uh, grand bargain coalition also there was a resistance to raising the question of war spending that is now falling by the wayside because you cannot address the issue of cutbacks and layoffs without addressing that that blue that blue chunk of the discretionary budget there on that graph, 57%, set almost $700 billion year in, year out, um, for what Eisenhower coined the military industrial complex and the giant corporations that um, fester and breed on our tax dollars behind it, like giant addicts of some sort. Our society just can't move forward. Okay, so bring it down to a local level, Brooklyn for Peace uh, has some great plans for this spring and summer. There are some, um, we were out in the street corner in Fort Greene this Saturday. We plan to be out this spring and all summer long putting the question of cutbacks versus military spending out in the public and, you know, pushing it into uh, congressional offices. Right now, you have the opportunity to help that campaign. It is not inexpensive. I think that uh, we got a request for printing tonight of posters on the anti-library uh, cutback uh, front. So we need, we need your funds tonight to make these campaigns real, to reach out to uh, people in our communities and inform them of what the sequester means and what this whole fight for new priorities in Washington means. So I'm asking you to be generous tonight and to reach into your pockets, take out a little more than you usually do and put it in the cans that are being turned around now, uh, spread out in the audience now, and contribute to uh, Brooklyn for Peace and Fort Greene Peace and make the fight for peace you know, powerful and effective in our community. So please do that. Anybody want to make a statement? Okay. Is somebody moderating the question? bad time and if you look out uh, there's a lot of suffering and I, I don't have any magic uh, answer to when people will get up stand up and you know turn this thing around when I was in high school I read uh, poetry and one poem in particular that stuck with me by E. e. Cummings and it's a line from a poem called uh, I Dream of Olaf, Big and Strong, which is a peace, movement, a peace poem. And there's a line in there that says, uh, there is some shit I will not eat. <laughs> now the operative word there is some. And we don't know at what point people just say, that's it. But we do know that people do do that. And we do know that organizing sets the groundwork for that. We do know that Rosa Parks was not just somebody who was tired one day and wouldn't do it. She was part of a social movement that was an organized activity, that was something that had been thought through, that had been attempted more than once before and didn't go anywhere, but there it was and it went. Go figure. Uh, so what we have to do is to just keep organizing, keep raising money, keep raising the issues, keep trying to build the broadest coalitions possible, 
and uh, identify what the sticking points are and address them. We can't do anything more than that. But if we do do that, then we can be confident that we've done what we can. And um, when, at some point, uh, this will come to an end. You, you know, one, one thing I always suggest to people in the peace movement, I don't think the peace movement is used to actually lobbying, and they're not used to counting votes in Congress. And hey, we all want to cut the military budget. You need a majority to do that. And what are you doing to get that majority? And you know, to say, oh, well, the guys in Brooklyn, they always vote the right way. People used to tell me at the state legislature, yeah, you always vote the right way. Uh, of the last 20,000 bills that came to the floor of the State Assembly, 19,999 of them passed. So tell me you're voting the right way when it gets to the floor, it doesn't do me much good. What are you doing to get it to the floor? So then you need to target um, congressional representatives a lot tougher than we do. And the other thing is I think that the real big grassroots movement, particularly on the young people at this point, uh, is climate change. And, you know, I've been trying to convince them they need to focus more on the military budget. One, once again, God, it's going to cost us $300 billion a year to convert to a carbon-free economy. Where can we get $300 billion? Military. Um, but also the military is the single largest, you know, user of fossil fuels. You know, the biggest corporate polluter. Um, if we were paying the actual cost of maintaining, I'm sorry, if Exxon and Mobil we're paying the actual cost of maintaining the aircraft carriers in the Middle East to protect those <coughs> oil supplies. Uh, the cost of oil would be about twelve to fifteen dollars a gallon. You know, the military is an incredible subsidy for the fossil fuel industry. And I don't think we make that point hardly at all. so that they can put up uh, big, expensive developments <coughs> right next to NYCHA. And that's privatizing that land. These privatized, the, the, the issue is privatization. We are losing our, our public uh, our public wealth, our commons. Um, I, I'm so thrilled with this thing that Mike handed out, the cost of war, because of two items on here that, that I think I haven't seen before in the National Priorities Project, and I am just thrilled to see them. Uh, 207,692 households converted to all solar energy for one year, and 438,500 households converted to all wind energy for one year. This is in New York City. If you add those two together, that's about 45% of the electricity that New York uses at peak time. We could, we could get rid of all of the frack gas that is happening in New York State and Pennsylvania. We wouldn't need any of it if we went for this. And I'm also thrilled with Mike talking about this military conversion because there is an issue in the, in, in the climate change movement called just transition, which is how you get all the oil workers and the frack workers, the gas workers, out of those jobs and the nuclear workers because they stand there and say 700 jobs at India Point, we can't possibly lose those jobs if you shut it down, we'll be out of work. So we need just transition for those workers. So this has to be combined. It's not just the, the guys who are working in the women who are working in the military jobs, but it's also the ones who are working in the energy sector. Well, I think that it's broader even than that because capitalism is by its nature uneven in its development. And so you have some industries that will grow and will d dominate and drive out of business other industries that are there, whether we're talking about the military or energy or any kind of industry. So what, what you need is overall a commitment to full employment. You need a commitment to making sure that there are jobs for everybody, whether they come out of Indian Point or they come out of the garment industry or they come out of wherever they come out of, that we need to have that broad commitment to full employment. 
And uh, it, it, that comes back to the last point that I made in my remarks. What kind of a country are we? What kind of a country do we want to be? And what vision do we project in terms of the nature of security, the nature of our mutual responsibility? And as you were saying, Martha, what about all this privatization? What is the role for public responsibility and for our responsibility to one another through the public sphere? It's not just my responsibility to myself to go buy what I need and get the money from any which way I can. That kind of a society is not a functional society. That's a dysfunctional society for the overwhelming majority of people. And we need to articulate that, talk about that, and have some <coughs> alternative ways of thinking about what our responsibilities are to one another that frames what we're doing, not just, oh, I want my library, or oh, I want my school funded, or oh, I want this, or oh, I want that. We really have to have all these wants and all these outlooks embraced in one common overall vision for what kind of a society we're trying to build. And I think that if we can do that, it will help to energize people. It will help to get people to see that they are not just in this alone with their library facing the overwhelming odds or with their particular school facing the overwhelming odds of the privatizers in the charter movement. That, that, that we really represent something which, which brings us together in a common fight. And that is what we need to articulate. Just quickly on the privatization of common lands, uh, there's a good uh, op-ed today in Huffington Post by Catherine Swan about the privatization of the New York City park system. Most of the major parks in New York City have already been taken over by this private-public hybrid. And the last jewel that they're going after, and apparently they've gotten, is Washington Square Park, what wow. you're doing right now. Washington Square Park, last one they haven't gotten. And they're doing that one right now. That's what the op-ed's about. Okay, so, question of the Yeah, just building on, uh, there's vision of what kind of world we want, and I, uh, and I asked you for some empathy on some of your thoughts because um, on one level it's a fairly simple equation. Cut back on the uh, funding of the military uh, and have money to spend on other things. But I think you made a reference to the fact that the uh, military is an inefficient part of the economy. I think that was part of uh, Jane Jacobs' criticism. You know, they don't do effective bidding. Uh, they exist to sort of blow things up. Uh, they don't like to share technology. Um, so, so that's one thing. Uh, also, uh, not having to spend money, money to spend on things is related to this growing income inequality that we've got in the country and the mindset that goes with it. The wealthy are saying, you know, we, we, we don't want to fund government. Um, you know, you've got figures out that when it comes to contributing to charity, the poor people contribute more highly than the wealthy, and when the wealthy contribute to charity, they want to do it with strings and some, get something back. And then uh, lastly, uh, that sort of ties into this point where I was raising about the star of the beast scenario, that's what they call it on the federal level. Um, so there are lots of people who are perfectly happy to see the military funded more uh, in order to uh, starve the rest of the the government, um, and then cut back, and you get the privatization, the selling off the libraries, the selling off the schools, the selling off the nature properties. Um, so there's really a lot more dynamics, and I offer that to you to take yeah. a run with it. Well, the star of the beast thing is, is uh, was, it, was it Grover Norquist, I think, who said what the goal is is to shrink the government to the point where it's small enough that we can put it in a bathtub and then drown it. I, I think that was the, the, the actual metaphor that he came up with. Going all the way back to the Reagan years and the Reagan budget, uh, David Stockman, who's still around and still writing uh, these uh, anti-debt screeds, uh, David Stockman was the budget director under Reagan. And when he left the Reagan administration in 1985, I think he wrote a book called The Failed Revolution. And it was how the tax cuts that Reagan put through in 1981 and 1982 did not actually do the job because by 1986 they raised the taxes again and re reconstructed the code and that's where we learned that the, what the strategy was was to cut the taxes, get this deficit up there and then use the deficit as a club to beat down the size of the government 
And that failed in the Reagan years, and it is succeeding now. And I think that the way that we need to respond to that in significant ways is to debunk this whole story that the debt and the deficit is a problem. You know, it's just a story. It's just not true. And actually, if you look at the numbers over the last three years, the debt is going down as a percentage of the, of the economy. The deficits are shrinking. And this is with the existing policies without even getting to the sequester and all the rest of this stuff. Just keep doing what we're doing and grow the economy. Provide people with jobs and revenue will come forward and the expenditure side can be handled. So I think that we really do need to look at this, this problem of the debt and the deficit. And if people want to hear more about it, I'd be happy to say it, but I'm not going to go into it right now. You know, during the last debate when they discussed a little bit the military, uh, Obama made this sort of funny joke. Oh, well, you know, we don't do bayonets much anymore. And what was the other one he put on the table? Something about horses? Ships. What? Ships. He ships. Well, ships. well, we also don't do tanks anymore. Um, you know, tanks are tanks are done for uh, you know land wars and the European plains against the Soviet Union, and that's not going to occur. So I was reading this book recently by Ralph Nader. Um, we have so many tanks, we park them, thousands of them, out in the desert, while we continue to build more of them. And another thing he, he pointed out is that the military sells things at fire sales uh, on eBay and Craigslist while they're buying the same thing on the private market. So he gave the example where they were selling uh, chemical hazardous suits for $3. And meanwhile, they were buying new ones for $300. The Pentagon has never been audited. They tried to audit the Pentagon during the Clinton years. They found, I think it was $7 trillion they're missing or some massive number, and they gave up. They can't audit them because they don't know what they're supposed to be doing with the money. So you don't actually have a game plan what you're supposed to do with the money. It's kind of hard to order it, but that's one of the demands is to bring some fiscal oversight to the military. The public does not support the majority cutting the military budget. And so we need to sort of frame that issue. National Winter, I think it was a new priorities project made this point. Um, they love veterans benefits. They want to help veterans. We got to deal with that. They hate wasteful Pentagon spending. So we got to hammer on the, you know, wasteful, you know, Pentagon spending. But, you know, it, it is good to economics. You know, we saw it during Reagan. It's basically, you know, cut taxes so it stimulate the economy. Well, that didn't work. Now we get this huge deficit. What do we do? Oh, we cut programs for the middle class. We cut the libraries. We cut the parks. We cut the schools. You know, they've done that with the IMF, all in Latin America and South America, and now they're doing it here in the United States. And we see that at the state level with, uh, who's that guy? Cuomo. You got Cuomo and you got Obama, and they're playing the same game. Allegedly, they're both Democrats. Okay, I don't have his questions. I know Veronica's next really quickly, so I'll try to get to him all really quickly. Right. And I just, I just think that's incredible right. that 
I just like, whoo! <laughs> so anyway, okay, so he's texting you guys to you guys, okay? So go yeah, we'll, you Good, so you're going to go around and get some I'm comments. Sure know, so guys yeah, let people, okay. let people add it, and then yeah. we'll come go back. Yeah, yeah, I'm agree uh, with the issue of the uh, prioritize the housing, the library, but also a lot of issues, uh, they want to crack the codes on um, 25 houses throughout the city, um, eventually eight right here uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and 10 years ago, um, before, um, after the Iraq war story, they closed four or five houses right here in Brooklyn. Um, and if they day concerns like a public safety uh, priority of uh, been wasting money for this and that, and all this um, privatizing this and that, um, bringing up uh, like future, uh, you know, like the tail chip, a concert um, series, or oh, the little drawing noise, this and that, and it was criticizing um, everything. Now I'm not wasting money for a uh, cover station um, in our uh, war walks, and people don't, they focus on recovery. Uh, it's like, uh, we have been six months after uh, Mega Storm Sandy um, strike our city. Um, now the governor, they threatening governor and the mayor were threatening to buy out of uh, their one, two, and three family properties uh, to make movement like um, privatize and put uh, a co-op. We talk about Canarsie, we talk about Coney Island, Sheepshead Bay, uh, Garrison Beach, Marine Park, and also Brighton Beach with the largest uh, Russian population. We need to, uh, to have to uh, get out and fight back, you know. We need to try to, you know, get the word out and um, and then hold them accountable, you know. So basically, time we do it, take back. And also, we have the issue with the educational system. Um, the both teachers, they all the overcrowded class sizes. Because um, we went to the opt out um, day um, in um, about, uh, about a week ago in Washington. And uh, also, um, they do have uh, more causes. Um, how they would have um, to keep the educational. Um, for children, uh, for the people society, instead of uh, going um, you, um, privatizing, um, they close out putting charter schools um, in um, in the same building in, in different public schools. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the opt out program. This, they changed the standardized testing to this Common Core curriculum, so they really haven't prepared the students for the test. So a lot of parents are just choosing to opt out of them. I don't know if someone else has something more to say about it. I don't know if you have any questions about it, um, or if you guys want to speak to that at all. Let's get back out okay, here. Okay, so you guys, you gentlemen, are next. Um, you know, yeah, there's, I'd like to offer a point um, in response to, uh, to to your comment about seeking like seeking one way to sort of follow money and and um, sort of unifying unifying strategy. Um, the thing about following money all the way back to its source of where money is created. Um, we can get a really powerful um, aspect of our government. Like government, the federal government holds the power to create money, but we've sort of complicated and split that power, delegating it, like putting it inside the Federal Reserve rather than inside the Treasury Department. So the Treasury has to issue debt and then swap it for money with the Federal Reserve. And that's sort of that's sort of how we get this, this debt or deficit. Um, right, right now there's a lot of talk about reducing the deficit that you would know, say under Clinton there was actually a surplus. Some people think that's a good thing, but during those times of surplus, when, when, the, when the deficit comes down, it's actually shrinking the amount of money that exists in the private, in the private economy. Because when you pay your taxes today, the, the, basically that is, that is money that is evaporated from the, the, the economy. Because the government, the government has an indeterminate amount of money available to it. It creates it and destroys it. As, as it, it creates it when it spends, and it destroys it when it receives. So um, I don't want to take up take up too much time, but but I encourage people to study the process of money creation, um, study the greenbacks. You know how Lincoln how Lincoln created money directly, not issuing debt. Study the the case of the the platinum coin signage, the trillion dollar coin story, which came out in January. It's actually an option that's still on the table. Obama could create a $60 trillion coin tomorrow in the Treasury Department, send it to the Fed, but our, our, the Treasury's account will be bumped up $60, uh, $60 trillion, pay down all the debt, and fund all the things we want to be funded, libraries, schools, food stamps, the whole shebang. 
full employment. So it's like this, this is getting at the crux of, of why there is not full employment in this country because the, the Federal Reserve has this split mandate for full employment, but they also have this, they're dominated by bankers. They, 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 yeah, they're serving the they're a funny case. I mean, they're like, they're, they're, they're supposedly, a, 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 I mean, they're created by Congress. They're, they're a governmental agency, but at the same time, if you looked at their, their director, at the, their board of directors, and they come from the world of banking, and they're dominated by the world of banking. Um, I was going to say, can I add something? Yeah, please, please. Can I ask a quick question here? So, the economist, um, maybe you can, this is like a kind of technical point. So, Federal Reserve, are they allowed to buy uh, mutual, uh, municipal and state bonds directly? So for example, let's say. Yes. So they are. So this, is, this is gets to what he's saying, I think, which is um, uh, if the Federal Reserve could buy state bonds directly, that's a way to fund state government activity. Is that wrong well, look, or right? Well, what, what do you well, think about I, that? I, 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 Without getting to, uh, I don't think we should just go, get too far into uh, the, the whole technical ends of the money business. The Fed, by tradition, uh, buys and sells government treasuries yeah. only. But more recently, as part of this uh, quantitative easing, they have bought other assets. They've bought, uh, uh, which is quite unusual for them, they've bought other assets off of banks' balance sheets. Yeah which creates reserves and which takes those assets off those banks' balance sheets. Um, there's nothing, I don't think, in the law that prevents them from buying any particular kind of asset. They can have any assets they want in their balance sheet. So one of the things that Ben is saying that I'm, I'm concerned about as well is when you talk about uh, the necessity to cut the military budget or you use phrases like this throughout the evening, like, where is the money? Where do we find the money? Um, it looks like there are avenues to find money, like, for example, having the uh, doing the quantitative easing, but doing it through buying state bonds or municipal bonds directly, which then can be used to fund anything the state wants. Uh, for example, that's one way. They don't involve cutting anyone. Well, see, the problem is that when the when the Fed buys bonds from the Treasury, they're buying bonds as a way for the Treasury to finance a deficit. State and local governments are by law and often by constitution prohibited from running deficits so that it really isn't uh, something uh, for their operating expenses which is analogous to the federal government. The federal government can decide what interest rate to charge. The Fed can, they don't, they don't, they can buy it below market interest rate. Well, let's not get into all that right maybe. here for all this audience. Let's not, so let, let's not do that. I don't know. There are other people who don't have a dialogue. Yeah. Well, talk about how we haven't talked for as long. We haven't talked about the people. Well, I tell you, I have no interest in continuing the discussion. So why don't we move on? Can you just say, in your, from your point of view, I mean, there's been a lot, there's a lot of talk about how terrible it is for us to have this deficit. Right. Well, I want to say some words about yeah, the deficit yeah. is significant. Thank you. Uh, the, I said in my uh, remarks that the deficit is made into this artificial boogeyman as a bludgeon to knock down government activity, and that that's inappropriate and, and wrong-headed. Usually the metaphor, the image that's given to us is that the government is just like your family. And you know, we sit at the kitchen table and we have to limit our expenditures to the revenues that, and the incomes that we have. And so uh, just as we can't go endlessly into debt as a family and as an individual, the government can't either. That's a completely inappropriate analogy. The, and the reason is because we die, and then things have to get settled up. The federal government does not die, and so it does not have to get settled up. The analogy is really more closely associated with businesses and corporations that borrow f all the time and never retire their debt completely. They roll it over. By when a debt comes due, they borrow to repay, repay that debt. 
The question is not are you in debt or are you borrowing the money? The question is what are you using the money for? If you're using the money for productive purposes, which are going to increase the uh, productive capacity of the society and the people in the society, that's a debt which will be able to pay for itself in the increased earnings and increased productivity of a healthy population, a well-educated population, a population and a business community that has good infrastructure to transport its goods, that has the kind of energy transmission system which is uh, relatively frictionless and uh, that you have a national energy grid which really does allow you to have energy produced in North Dakota on wind that can be transmitted to New Jersey where they don't have that much. So those kinds of debts are not inappropriate. If you have a debt to go buy an ice cream cone, well, that may be a problem. And I would say that going and having a military that does nothing productive and borrowing for that military does undermine the economic strength of the country. But it isn't because there's a deficit, it's what is the money being used for? And that is the point that gets lost in all of these discussions about the debt and the deficit. So I don't know if that, I mean, just as a, as a place to start. Uh, so so uh, one other uh, point that's often made is if the government borrows, there's a limited amount of funds that are available to borrow. And if the government is borrowing, then the private sector and private business will not have as much resources or they'll have to bid up the interest rate in order to get the money. And so that uh, is going to squeeze out, government borrowing is going to squeeze out private sector uh, investment. Well, that may be the case if you're operating on full employment and you've got a bit of inflation going. But that's not the situation that we have now. You can't make a claim that the federal government is crowding out the, public, the, the private sector. The private sector is sitting on $4 trillion of cash that they are not investing. They don't have to borrow until they get past $4 trillion of investment. So the idea that somehow this deficit is crowding out the public sector, the private sector, and making jobs more difficult to create is completely bogus, has no bearing on reality. It's just a story that's told to get us to think that, oh my God, we have to do something and we have to cut the government because we can't possibly have higher taxes. Right. I mean, in New York State, the richest 1% now get 35% of their income. The last time we saw that, was in the late 1920s, right before the Great Depression. I would argue that's a much bigger problem that this country is facing than the so-called deficit. We allegedly have had a recovery, an economic recovery, but the number of jobs that have been restored are about half of what we've gotten traditionally in economic recoveries, and the jobs that have been restored have overwhelmingly been poverty level or lower jobs replacing middle class jobs. We need to stimulate the economy. Europe took the austerity measure, which they're debating right now in Congress. Their gross domestic product went down. You know, we can put our country into another tailspin if we want. A lot of people think we're very close to that. We would say focus on putting those 28 million people back to work. And one of the ways you, you know, Traditional Keynesian economics, you know, in a recession, government spends to increase demand, and especially with all this money sitting out there in the private stuff. And a lot of say because we, the Federal Reserve, or I don't know who does it, but you know, giving away money for zero percent interest to the banks, that's not, in many of our opinion, good for the economy. It's not good for us senior citizens who are trying to rely upon secure investments, which now get zero percent. Um, we're taking the wrong economic strategy. And that needs to be the message to Congress. Put the deficit discussion back to, to the side. Focus on rebuilding the economy, putting people back to work. And for God's sakes, it's been 60 years, cut that military budget. Any more minutes and stuff if you guys want to wrap it up? What was that? I would just repeat the point. Target your Congress people and your senators. Um, the deficit's not the problem. Uh, the economy's the problem. Uh, they need to focus on full employment. They need to focus on income inequality. Um, you know, 
we only have seven percent of state legislators being sent to jail uh, in the last you know 12 13 years um, a much higher percentage are engaged in corrupt activities uh, but activities that would land you uh, in jail uh, during the Watergate era, you know, now get you, uh, you know, Politician of the Year award. Um, I mean, bribery and corruption is just rampant throughout the political monetary system, and the the wealthy have bought the political system. And until we change that, unfortunately, not much else is going to change. Well. It's a, it's a hard slog we're in the middle of. There's no doubt about it. There's a question that came up before, you know. But uh, to World War II, in World War II, the top marginal tax rate in the United States was 91%. In World War II, everybody fought, everybody paid for it. And uh, that uh, we could learn something about that. Uh, and I, I think that there isn't anything that legitimately unites the country uh, that way, except the possibility of uniting the 99% to reorder the priorities of the country. Um, that can't happen, obviously, without a social movement. And social movements aren't effective just by having opinions. Social movements are effective when they're disruptive. Social movements are effective when they really challenge, in a powerful way, the people who have power. And that is the task that we have. What's up here?